So welcome uh, today at this uh, fireside chat of Empowering Innovators. Uh, today I have with me uh, Guy, who is the uh, co-founder of uh, Moby Train, a startup bootcamp uh, alumni, um, who's been scaling up uh, in the last uh, few years. And today we're going to talk about uh, you know, raising money uh, before, during, and probably also after uh, the COVID uh, situation and the COVID times. Welcome, Guy. How are you today? Hi, Patrick. I'm uh, very fine. Thank you uh, for asking. Uh, all good. Hey, maybe we should briefly start by explaining to the audience uh, today uh, what Moby Train is exactly doing and what problem you are solving for your customers. Can you do your one minute pitch? Yeah, sure. So, Moby Train is a, a mobile micro learning platform specifically geared towards uh, uh, frontline employees. So we see that a lot of people that work in the front line uh, are difficult to reach, working in shifts, don't have a lot of time. And in order to train them in a fun and effective way and also a scalable way, we have made our platform. Um, and we're working with clients like Events, Timberland, Diesel, so a lot in retail. Uh, but also uh, we're working now more and more in industrial services and even cities. We just won the city of Antwerp, uh, where they also have a lot of remote uh, people in the field that they want to train in a more innovative uh, way. So you you are closing deals even in the in the COVID uh, in COVID times. Um, yes. yes. Yeah. It's very different. I mean, we we had a short chat a few weeks ago where you mentioned that when uh, we got into lockdown and you as well, you're based in Belgium, that you lost uh, a quite a few deals or that were put on hold, especially in the retail environment. Can you explain a little bit? how things have been so far, maybe when COVID started and you were in lockdown and how you see the business developing now going forward? Yeah, of course. Yeah, in the beginning, of course, as with the focus that we have in retail, and that was at that time really our, our prime focus, uh, we had some, some great deals, uh, for example, with retail outlet parks. But with everything that happened with COVID, yeah, that was just closing down. There was even no online sales that they could do. So it was just going from 100% to zero. Uh, and that, of course, had also an, um, an influence on our sales. So we, we missed a few deals there that even were closed. But in the meantime, what we see is that uh, after now, let's say two months, uh, because in the beginning, all companies were actually in a sort of shock. Um, so even the companies that wanted to do certain things in a more digital way, it was not the right timing. But now, step by step, we see quite a lot of companies coming to us and saying like, hey, with everything that happens, we want to go more digital. We want to do more digital training, also mobile training. And, and that uh, helps us in our new uh, sales strategies. And there we see that also the closing times are getting shorter and shorter because they really say, hey, we need this and we want to start in, in next month or in two months from now. So the sales cycle is getting shorter and shorter uh, because of that. Yeah, so, so the pain has become bigger and they see that you're, val that you're adding value with your solution. So that closes you know, the gap between first conversation and closing the deal. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been hearing that with quite a few of our alumni that the cycles are getting way shorter because they just see, you know, the whole digital transformation is going faster than ever. So, yeah. uh, and the adoption rate of people is just increasing and they're more open to do that. So that's, that's actually good news. So the future looks bright for Moby. Uh, yeah, train, I guess. We, we hope so. I always say we need to be careful, of course. We are not, uh, let's say, the Zoom of this world where everybody jumped on it when the crisis started. Uh, so that's not uh, what we yeah. have. But the, the signals we see so far is that uh, the traction is there. Uh, if we can close uh, some of those deals, then, uh, then I believe we're completely on track with our plan of this year. And with everything that happened, I think that's a good story. Very good. Hey, let's go to fundraising. Um, you, uh, you raised in the last uh, few years multiple rounds. Um, can you explain a little bit how you started? And I think the first time that you raised funding was... For Moby uh, Train, it was actually the first time that U.S. co-founders also raised money from external parties. Can you explain a little bit how you experienced that process? Yeah. So, of course, we had prior to our first real round, I would say, we did the normal uh, rounds where we went to business angels, to family and friends. Uh, that's how it all started in the beginning. That was 2015. Um, at that time, it was not really a process, I would say. It was just pitching your ID, people that believe in it, and you got the first 100,000, 200,000 euros uh, step-by-step in the door. Um, 
But after we did uh, the program with Startup Bootcamp, we said, okay, now we want to go into a next phase. Um, also for me personally, because at that time I was still combining uh, with another job. So I was not full-time in the company. So we said, we want to raise around. Uh, I want to jump full-time in the company and we are really going to build this uh, further than an ID. Um, in order to get to that stage, um, for me, it was important, uh, the preparation, um, because that was indeed the first time. Um, and to look for uh, where can we have complementary skill sets. Uh, for me personally, uh, I was pretty good in doing the storytelling, building a presentation, and yeah, of course, uh, saying what it's all about and why we want to do this. But then, of course, an important thing are the numbers. So how can we uh, show the numbers, the financial plan and everything there? And that's where, via the network, uh, we came in touch with uh, Marcel, uh, which is now also an investor and our CFO. So it started in a very independent uh, way, uh, working a few hours a week for us, making the financial plan. But step by step, uh, we, we came closer. We, we had a lot of fun together in that uh, process. And that's how we went to that first round. So I would say preparation, building the right documents, and I think we will get to that uh, later on as well, was a crucial step. Um, together with having a good idea, what do we want to raise? Uh, how much do we want to raise in this round? Uh, what are we going to do with it? Uh, that bringing together in a good plan, um, that was the first step, uh, let's say, to, to a successful round. And how did you figure out what the amount was that you actually needed to take the company to the next stage? Was that something that you uh, discussed eventually with, uh, with Marcel, that, that is actually somebody with a strong financial background, has been helping startups to raise money. So he's a mentor at Startup Bootcamp, but eventually he sort of like became an investor in your company as well. But can you explain a little bit the process, how that, how that went, how you got to the first numbers to say, okay, this is probably will take us to this milestone. Uh, uh, from one uh, angle, it's all about the financial plan and, and your goals there. So how do you see it coming in from sales? How much you want to spend? How do you see the team coming together? And then, of course, you see where the gap is and that gap needs to get closed. And you don't want to close that with exact that amount because you know that things will not go like you think uh, it will go. And that can both be on the cost side as on the revenue side. Uh, so you try to have some extra margins in there. Um, and that's how we came to, let's say, a first number. Um, and then it's important, I think, in the beginning that you need to see, do you want to have a very high margin? Uh, so imagine you say, if I look to my cost and my revenue, we need 1 million, but you never know what happens. Let's shoot directly for 2 million. Uh, of course, when you're in the early stages, you give a lot away. So we said, let's be careful with that and let's go rather for the million. Um, prove in one year that we can do those steps that we think that we're going to do and then we will do a second round and step by step build up the amounts uh, with more and more proof points because the, the biggest difficulty in the beginning is you don't really have data you have an ID you have a few customers but really hard data to say okay if we put thousand euros in marketing we will get three thousand back you don't have it. And, and that's, of course, a very important thing once you want to go to the more uh, venture capitalists and, and bigger investors. Yeah, yeah. So one thing is looking at the amount of money that you need. The other thing is looking at, you know, what is a potential valuation of the company and what is the valuation actually that investors want to step in to. Is that something that you also discussed in depthly and how did you got, got to the number where you think, okay, we think this is a fair valuation. Did you get a lot of pushback uh, from investors on that valuation? Yeah, I think there are many ways you can do evaluation. And of course, with a very early stage company, it's very, very difficult. So it will be more something where you need to feel comfortable on both sides. But what, what it will drive is your projection on how you can grow and what you will bring on the table one year from now, two years from now. And every investor who is a little bit serious knows that if you say next year, I'm going to do two million and, and you're having zero, the chances are, yeah, you always have a chance, but depending on which business you are, they know this is not going to happen. But building your story and showing that you can think about the numbers uh, is much more important because as so which number is there, that was less important, I see, for investors, but showing that we understand how we're going to do that and how they correlate with each other and uh, that uh, if you don't have that revenue that you can also scale down with your costs and all that kind of things, that's, I think, the most important um, uh, thing they looked at. Looking at then the valuation as such and the number, 
there will always be investors that that uh, sh that can go higher and that can go for a higher valuation but you also need to be careful because if it's your first round you will have a second round so within that first round you put a valuation very high based on no data but you cannot in one year's time go far enough with your revenue and all your data points then you will have a difficult uh, moment eh? because then you need to go with a with a, a round uh, that goes lower which nobody likes so that's why we always said from the moment, let's try to be realistic, but with a good business plan, with a good reasoning why we get to that number. And then the pushback was relatively low. So we didn't have very difficult uh, discussions on the valuation, I would say. Okay. You, you structured the, um, the one million that you raised in the first round in, in, in different ways, right? You, you basically said, okay, we're going to do partly equity, we're going to do partly grants, we're going to do partly bank loans, which for a startup, you know, getting a bank loan is not so you know common to do that in the early stage. Can you explain a little bit why you went in different directions and leveraged bank loans and grants together with the entity uh, that you eventually sold to uh, to investors? Yeah, well, I think because it's it's a uh, it's a good thing to do, not putting everything in capital if you can. So I would say every startup try it. Uh, the more you can leverage on a base of capital uh, investment, but then you can use also grants and bank loans uh, or other instruments. Uh, that's, of course, a, a great way to get more money without uh, giving your shares away. Um, and, do, and it's important to understand how you can get there. For example, with, with banks, um, the first time I got a, a tip from someone to go to a bank, uh, they told me this person is really in charge of startups, have a discussion uh, with the lady, and, and you will see this is going to go in a good direction. I did it. I sent our business plan and two weeks later, the person said like, no, it's not possible uh, to get uh, any loan. Um, two weeks later, I met somebody else. Eh? That's why I think networking is important. That person says, oh, you went to that bank. Uh, who did you meet that person? No, you should go to another person um, and I can arrange it, uh, the meeting for you. So they made a meeting. It was around Christmas. I still remember because yeah, everything was a little bit uh, down. Uh, we met uh, between Christmas and New Year at their office with uh, two people of the bank. They asked me to pitch for, let's say, uh, one hour, our plan, uh, how we want to do it. And at the end of the discussion, they said, okay, uh, they looked at each other and they said, 100,000, 150,000 euro we can give you. So that was it. It went very easy because you had the right person in the bank who also looks over, um, yeah, they try to, to, to be close to innovative companies. They have their special uh, war, uh, let's say, uh, money for that. Um, and that's how we got to that money. The same thing with the second bank that we get now uh, on board. So it's really knowing the right people. And even in the same bank, somebody can say no, but another person say, says yes. Yeah, um, it's more or less the same as with angel investors or VCs. You need to talk to quite a few, maybe yeah. in, in the same community, in order to find uh, one. You, you mentioned that uh, you talked to about 30, 40 different investors, and that actually the, the investor that you talked to first, which was not that interested or the timing was not good, eventually was the one that you closed the deal with. Can you explain how that went and were you very persistent to eventually still get them on board? Or what, what tricks did you use in the book? to eventually convert them? Yeah, so uh, first of all, again, I think networking is, is really crucial and important because if you get to investors just in a cold way, you can do it and we did it as well, but it's different than when somebody can put your uh, deck on the table. Huh? So actually the investors that in the end invested were always people where in one or another way we, we came warm to the table. Now, um, in the first round that we did for the million, we had around, I think, 50, 55 people that we approached, uh, different companies. Uh, often we did that with a sort of teaser. Uh, so that was not a full deck, but just a little teaser. And then you need, we saw that around 40, 45 of them saw the teaser, really went uh, looking into it. And then we came to our end meetings. We had quite a lot of meetings. So that conversion ratio was really good. And then you get into the same thing as with clients uh, many times. Uh, some people, it's just not the right timing. They just did an investment in, for example, the learning space in our case, and they can like it, but they will not do it. Um, and actually, the, the first investor we saw who in the end invested, uh, LRM, they, they liked it. So they were really interested, but they said, currently, with the team we have, with everything that's happening here at our company, we just don't have the time to go in depth. So we will need to wait two months. Um, and then you also see that it was not something that they just say to let you go away. If they're really interested and they say that, 
it's true. So two months later, we went back. And then actually in a very short period of time, we could close it and, and they came on board. Uh, but being persistent, uh, reaching out to a lot of parties, uh, knowing that you will get a, a lot of no's uh, and dealing with that. It's not because your ID is, is bad. It's just the way it goes. Um, and then in the end, sometimes you get to the conclusion, yeah, that first investor was the investor that did it. Why did we spend seven months in total? But that's how it goes. Yeah. So it took about six, seven months to, let's say, you know, from first conversations to sign the deals and get the money in the bank. You know, how, how much of your time and your co-founders' times actually went to this process, uh, which meant that you couldn't focus on running the business? How did you deal with that? Yeah. So first of all, we made sure that not all of us need to be involved in it. So it was mainly Marcel uh, and myself who took, let's say, 80% of the, the workload. Uh, in the preparation of the meetings, doing the meetings uh, itself. Of course, uh, once you go into the next phases with some investors, they want to see the team, you want to do a presentation, but then still, that's not that much time. Some things of that process even are really good for the team because you're challenged. You're challenged by people that look at your business, you're sitting together. So basically, it's free consulting, free strategy meetings where for every business, it's good to do that now and then. And now actually you get it offered by people that are very experienced. So piece of the work and, and the time that you spend in it, I think is very useful time. On the other hand, uh, for me personally, uh, being also in charge of doing more sales, that was the thing. You're doing the, the sales to get the money in and you cannot spend that much time on bringing clients in. And that was definitely a significant amount, which you also could see that, yeah, you cannot really progress on both sides at the same time in our case. Um, that's why, yeah, you don't want to do this uh, every three months. Uh, and if you do it, you better do it good so that you have your runway for the time that, that, uh, that you want to do it. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it's yeah. interesting that you say actually, you know, that due diligence process or talking with the, with the investors, what sort of like strategic coaching or advice. And obviously it's also getting to know these people and see if you can actually, you know, communicate and if you can add value to each other and if you respect each other uh, are there specific things that come out and uh, have come out of these sessions that actually were implemented eventually into the business maybe on the functionality or on the business model or on the go-to-market well uh, at least uh, we had a lot of discussions uh, because of it and the point is there is also not one party who has all the wisdom because we saw very good placed VCs who told us like, hey, for your business, we think you need to go on just one vertical. I put all your money, let's say, in retail and everything you do will be with retail and that's it. And they mentioned and saying it like, look, we are here as a, a VC. So we, of course, have 10 companies. We are going to take the risk, but we believe the, the best chance you will have if you just focus on one vertical. If it works, we're all happy. If it doesn't work, yeah, we still have nine other companies. For you, it's bad luck. That was their vision. But then you see other uh, very well-placed uh, firms who have a different view and who say, like, in the stage where you are right now, why you should focus only on one vertical. You just need to discover more, like, which vertical is really going to give you the best traction. And then in the next phase, yes, we, we agree you're going to go on that full focus. So what we did in the end is at the beginning, we, we went more because we had already some deals. We were more evolving into that first one where we said, yes, focus on retail. But in the meantime, we were, yeah, for let's say 20% saying, now let's also keep our eyes open and see what else we can do. Now, uh, a few months later, uh, we're maybe happy that it was not only retail because with what happened, yeah, if it's only retail, it would not be the best time and, and we would lose definitely a year. And, and now we don't lose that year. So you see, it's, it's just speaking about it, having those discussions with the team, uh, challenge each other. That was for me more relevant than just saying, hey, that party said the right thing. No, it's not like that. If you look back on that, raising that first million, are there things that you would or are doing very differently in a second round that you raised based on the insights that you took from, let's say, that first phase? Yeah, we have seen, first of all, that our second round went faster. Huh? So we did it, let's say, in five months. Um, there was, of course, not a summer period in between that also helps. But in general, it went faster. We had also less contacts. And that's, again, the networking thing. Huh? We had a lot of investors in the first round who were really interested but it was too early uh, but we kept contact with them and we're still doing that because we know that with the second round there were other parties interested 
which might be very good in the third round or even in the fourth round, whatever happens. So from that network, then things, of course, go faster because they know you already. The current investors who who were on board with the first round, yeah, they were they wanted to follow in the second round. So this was all uh, much easier. The in, most important thing that changed, I think, is more control of our data room. So making sure that all our documents, contracts, that we had it really good in place and that we put quite a lot of time uh, in it and that now we also keep it there so that we know if there is a next round in uh, one year or six months from now, then basically this is all ready. Uh, we just, each time when there's a new contract, we put it in that data room uh, all year long, so we're prepared. Uh, so that's definitely something we changed. Um, and the other thing is the way how we look at our business with data so that we try to have all the numbers where we know that they're important for investors and in a SaaS business, we all know what those numbers are, that we, we track them. Uh, we, 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 on a monthly basis, we report on them also to our board so that by the time we go to a next round, it's going to be much easier because you have data points which we didn't have in the past. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the data room that you just uh, mentioned, did, did you use any specific software to, uh, to gather all the data you know, in, in one environment or are you just putting everything in Google Docs where you have specific forms? How are you organized? I mean, we have a few software that actually use software that is specifically built for data rooms or yeah. how do we you do that? Now, we didn't do it with specific software. I think, of course, we for our due diligence in the stage we are, you need to look in certain things, but it's also not that there is a tremendous amount. So it's more already having a good structure and making sure you have the documents stored in a secure way. That's the way how we did it so far. Um, I think, yeah, it will be maybe two stages further where you go into specific softwares, but I think in the beginning it's not necessary. As long as if you see that it's done in a structured way, a professional way and in a secure way. Yeah. Hey, if you look at raising your ne next round, which you just addressed, which was almost double of your first round, um, you mentioned things went faster, but what was the moment that you said after closing that first round, hey, now X months later, we, we need to go raise again? You know, how much time was there in between? How did you know? Was it just that you thought that you could scale up faster and needed to money to grow maybe from your first 10 customers to 100? How did you look at that and how did you decide? Because that also means that you need to dilute again as founders. And Yeah, well, we knew it actually up front. It was always the idea when we did the first round that we said, let's say we, between one year and one year and a half, a maximum, we will do our second round. So that was from day. And what we wanted to do with the first round was make sure that we had our full product and also making sure that we have a team on board. And with the second round, actually, uh, it was more, how can we now go to more commercialization? How can we make sure that we go from 10 customers to 100 customers? Um, so our runway with the first round, originally, we knew it was very uh, small. So we had only, let's say, one year, one year and a half at best. But, you know, never things go exactly like it is. So it's rather one year. That's also why we knew that after when we raised that first round, that probably, uh, yeah, four or five months later, we would do it again. But knowing that we had good contacts, that we have the network, that we have good documentation so that we could do it in a much more uh, agile way. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and how long should this round now last? And did you burn oh. more because of COVID and maybe the revenues went down or how do you, how do you look at that? Yeah. So with this round, actually, we said that we were thinking around one year and a half, two years. So we made it a bit longer. Uh, and our uh, first idea was this year, we want to have a full year just on the business. So actually this year, we are 100% sure we don't need to worry about uh, money. There is money in the bank. We see that clients are there. We are in line with our uh, budget. So that's all good. Um, and then basically, um, yeah, next year we also are still good. It's not that it's going to be urgent at the beginning of the year, but then we can start looking from a strategic point of view, what do we want to do? And if we see that with the traction that we have now coming from COVID, if it would even go higher, yeah, we might go even faster because then you want to take and grab the momentum. Um, because, yeah, getting money when you don't need the money is even better than uh, when you wait till uh, it's uh, nearly too late. Yeah. If you look at the due diligence process of your first round and then the second one, was there, was there much difference? Were the investors, because the, the amount of money is a bit higher, the valuation was also probably higher, uh, were they looking more critical or was the process, in your opinion, more or less the same? I would say for 90%, the process was the same. Um, and 
On some things, even the first due diligence was a little bit tougher than the second one, uh, because uh, although the amount is higher and the valuation is higher, on the first round, they did also a technical review. So they really went looking into the product, looking into the code, and, and really doing a review on that. In the second round, they didn't do it anymore because they, they, yeah, they had a trust from the first round. Yeah, parties looked at it. They said, okay, there is one year in between. We see the team, so we, we trust on that. But now we got, okay, a formal due diligence from a third party, which we didn't get in the first round. So if you take it all together, in the first round, we had a technical due diligence, which we didn't have in the second, but the financial and, and organizational due diligence, we had it in the second round, not in the first. But from a time perspective and overall, I would say it was uh, pretty similar. Yeah. And then and the investors that stepped in first, some of them actually invested again. Uh, did any of them ask for specific a specific... Uh, treatment or specific deals or did everybody get in under the same deal eventually? Yeah. Now we came to a stage where of course you get differences. Eh? So uh, we have the two of the investors who have now also a board seat, uh, which was not uh, in the first round there. Um, and we also work with two, uh, yeah, two classes of shares um, to make a difference there, which is very common. Uh, but I think there the most important thing uh, I mentioned already by raising uh, money, uh, having experts that support you. Uh, one of them was uh, Marcel as our mentor. Another party that we use is our uh, lawyer. And we took a lawyer really specifically uh, specialized in uh, startups, scale-ups, uh, working also together with a lot of VCs. So a very uh, specialist lawyer um, in the field. Uh, and I must say that helped a lot because they know how everything works. So they can also easily help you on, okay, this is a little bit strange. Uh, and we had very good discussions. And without that support, it would be much more difficult. And I think you see a lot of investors, they try, uh, which is their good right. Uh, so if you don't have that kind of parties on your side, then yeah, it could become a uh, yeah, not in a good way, I would say. But now everything is uh, done in a fair way. Yes, there are differences, but in line with how it come, yeah, how it goes in uh, in normal deals from this size. Right. Are you already planning your next round? Uh, planning in the sense, yes, by executing our plan, uh, our budget, uh, and that's the most important thing to go to the next round. I mean, like we know that if we do what we say uh, or are very close to it uh, in the positive or the negative way, uh, of course, we prefer the positive way, then the next round, I think it, it becomes easier and easier the further you go because you have more proof points. Uh, and then it's more, I think, from a strategic point of view, who do you want to have? Uh, is it from a region point of view because you want to go to Germany? So, hey, it's interesting to have a German VC that steps on board from the network. Uh, or is it a different reason? So that's more, I think, discussions rather than will we find money? Um, but there the most important thing is just uh, doing the business right with the team. And, and that's what we're focusing on now uh, for the moment. Yeah. So, so that last round that, uh, you know, could you divide a bit maybe or explain a little bit how you divided that money over investment in product, maybe in team and marketing? Did you, was that already part of the plan of the, the money that you, that you raised that you said, okay, this is how we're going to spend it. And are you actually sticking to that plan or is it, you know, moving a little bit more to the left or the right? Oh, of course, we mentioned in the big lines like, okay, rather, let's say 30% goes more into product. And, and of course, because in our business, you cannot stop developing the product. Eh? We need to uh, develop further and, and put more innovation in it uh, all the time. Um, but the biggest chunk of this round was set from the beginning that goes into sales marketing. Eh? So, um, and with sales marketing, first of all, building a marketing engine. Uh, so really working with an agency, starting to do much more on social media, doing our advertising, because we never did that in the past. It was all coming from a network. And, and that's, of course, costing uh, money. So that's a big chunk together with building a team. And building the team is not from day one, because now it's myself together with our partnership director who do most of the sales, just because we want to see everything, we want to do it ourselves, refine all those procedures, playbooks, etc. And if that's all good, then we want to bring people in, which we still plan to do also this year. Um, and that's the biggest chunk. So are we on track with that? Yes, because we made a big uh, financial plan beginning of the year, which was also uh, part of the discussions on, on the funding. So people knew pretty much on all the lines, okay, what do we foresee? 
some things changed conferences yeah they're not happening now so okay we spent in different things but that are rather uh, smaller things yeah yeah if you look at the, the process of fundraising is that something that you personally enjoy um it's, it's just the same thing as with sales yes and no i i really uh like it because i've done business development uh, all my life so it's part of uh, my dna i think but getting the nose sometimes for everyone is getting uh, tough you know and if and definitely if in sales you if it's not your own product okay you win a deal you lose a deal but when it's about uh, your own company together with uh, the co-founders and you have an id and you get companies who say we really love this we like it and then you get to some investors who all say like no 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 then you start doubting sometimes and you think like yeah is it us are we wrong is our product wrong is there something that we need to do different or not and that are the moments where sometimes yeah it's becoming tough like with every uh, entrepreneurial journey uh, and but then in the end when you go to the finish then it's becoming again very fun and and enjoyable uh, doing the pitching and the conversation and the challenging uh, things, like I said, also on strategy, I really enjoy it because you can speak with a lot of people, you get some insights. But sometimes, like I said, the the a lot of getting no's sometimes can get a little bit uh, tough. Yeah. So what do you do then when you when you let's say that you had three no's on a day? How do you go home and talk to your 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 family? And uh, do they feel and see that you're frustrated? Do you? Yeah get a Belgian beer to drink it off or how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, hearing no can be very painful. Uh, yeah. It can also bring a lot of learning experiences, but how do you deal with that personally? Yeah. Well, I think for me, it's, uh, I like to do sports. Uh, so it helps uh, to go running, uh, swimming, cycling, but I need to do a lot of sports and I still do it every week. Uh, if I get a lot of yeses or noes, doesn't matter, just to make my head clean. And I think that's really important. Next to that, speaking uh, and talking with your team, of course, also your family and friends. But if I look at the business, being able to share it with people, being able to ventilate it and say like, okay, this was really shit because of this and this and this, and I don't understand why that person said it. And, and you give support to each other. So having a good team where you can rely on, where people believe in it and say like, okay, let's go on. Three say uh, no, but we still have uh, four in the pipeline, whatever. Uh, and for me, uh, mentally, personally, having the, the sports is uh, what does it. And if I would not do it, then it's becoming, I think, a very difficult thing. Yeah, I can imagine. You have to clear your head sometimes and do something really different, which can be physical, uh, in order to you get that out of your system, uh, literally, and then pick it up again the next day. Hey, last question, and then I'm going to ask you maybe to, to share some tips on, on what other founders that are fundraising or aim to fundraise, uh, what they should and, and, and shouldn't do. Um, um, I always advise to, to well, what I've learned, let's say, in fundraising is that many investors more or less ask the same questions or give the same feedback. Um, and then I say, you know, also to make it a little bit more scalable and not dependent on one or two persons is keep track of all those questions. Uh, because, you know, if these questions are, and, and, and if there's new questions, just add them to a list. Is there a system that you kept of questions that come back or questions that you never got and you added to the list to think about how to answer them better? Is there a methodology that you're using to, to, to come across maybe smarter, better to be able to answer the questions that you get? Yeah. Well, I think that the good thing is that in the beginning, it starts with creating a good deck. Uh, and I mean, like, if you think really uh, in a detailed way about what needs to be in that deck, then probably you can cover already 90% of those questions. Because exactly like you said, most of the questions are the same. And then the second piece that we saw is that when you go in a second round or a third round with an investor and they're really serious and also a good company, then they will uh, challenge you with, uh, let's say, a quite heavy questionnaire where they say, these are all the extra questions that we have on top of everything you showed. And then, of course, once you did that for one party, then you can start building on that because the next party, yeah, probably 10 of those questions are the same. They might have three different questions. You bring it together in one doc. So you keep tracking one doc of all the questions. And if you see that some things are coming back as extra questions, yeah, then it's probably nice to put it also in your deck and already make one slide on it so that you can take it out of the way the next time. All right, so I think that's the way, in a pragmatic way, how we saw it, really trying to put a lot of attention on the starting deck to cover already most of them. And then from there, keeping track each time when we got new questions, 
uh, to document it and making sure that we can use it in the next uh, discussion. Yeah, that's already good advice, I think, uh, going forward for, uh, for fundraising. Hey, if you look at, you know, look backwards, you've done now it uh, multiple times, so you're not a virgin in fundraising anymore, you're now yeah. having experience, so that's good. Um, you know, what, what would be your, let's say, your top two, three tips that you would give to founders that are uh, either currently, which, which might be challenging. On the other hand, I also see that there's a lot of money available in the market. Uh, you know, that's not all burned, uh, and, and actually the market is picking up again. I see that in the early stage, but also in the mid and later stage domain. Um, what would be your major, let's say, tips or advices that you would say, if you could pick two or three, what you would say, I, I would do this, you know, start like this, do this, don't do that. Uh, what yeah. would you share? So I think definitely now I agree there is money is there. So that will not be the, the difficulty, but it's more like uh, starting in time because I think people will be very ca careful. It's always important to start on time. Like I said, for us, it was seven months, the second round, five uh, months. So you, you need to take your time for it and definitely now. Um, so that's uh, an important thing. Um, the second point is, and it's the same thing as in sales, actually, making sure you speak with the right people. Uh, so try to get as fast as possible uh, a partner or somebody of, yeah, really management on board in those discussions. Because if you need to do three discussions with an analyst um, and all respect uh, to them as well, but then you still don't know if this is going somewhere. And sometimes it's even that they're just getting information from you because they're looking at another company and it has nothing to do that they're going to invest in you. So that can also give you a lot of uh, negative energy that you gave a lot of information for nothing. So... Um, now, if I see that an analyst reaches out, uh, actually, we will say, oh, we, we have uh, interest uh, to speak, but I would love to have also one of the partners or who is in charge of this vertical so that we can have the discussion in the most uh, efficient uh, way possible. Um, then another thing is, uh, I would say, the preparation. Uh, we said it. So have um, a few documents ready. So one document is a teaser. So it's not the heavy deck because in the beginning, an investor will not go through 50 slides or 60 slides. So really something where they see even in one page or an executive summary, but in a nice way done, like, wow, this is a company that I want to want to see more of. Uh, then you get your investor deck, which is important to, to work on together, of course, with your financial plan. And the tip there is if you are not a financial wizard, look for somebody who can really support you here because this can make a big, big difference uh, moving forward. Um, and then the last piece, like I said, from that uh, preparation is that data room. So the better you can prepare it, the smoother you will have in the end uh, your money on, on the table, eh? the faster. Because we have seen investors where they said normally when they go into the due diligence, they take or they think about three months uh, from starting till the end. Um, but if you have everything in place and you can be really quick, then you can make it even in two months. And if you don't do it, it will become five months. Because they don't care. If you don't have the information ready, then they wait another two weeks or three weeks. And before you know, uh, you missed your deadline. Um, so that are a few important things. And then the last one, maybe to close, which we already mentioned, is really think about uh, structuring your financing. So don't think about one way it's capital. But if you know with your budget plan, we need one million. OK, then how much we want to get out of capital? Okay, if we get 400 from capital, we think we can leverage this with the other things. And yeah, the sooner you can get in conversations with uh, those people, of course, they will depend on each other. A bank will not give you the loan if you don't have the capital, but you can do the conversation with the bank and saying, if I bring the 400K capital, then you give me this loan. So you don't need to wait for it. And, and even better, if the bank already said yes, and you go to your investor saying like, I have already a bank who wants to give 150. That's definitely a very good argument to give that uh, last push. So that are a few things which I think if, if you take that into consideration together with asking and taking advice from experts, that will help you a lot in your process. Yeah, no, that's great advice. I think it's very much about organizing the process and doing that in the most effective way. And like with everything basically in business and maybe even in life, it's all in the preparation, right? If you're not prepared, you know, it will take longer. You will not make the impression that you probably want to make. So it's very much about thinking things through before and then actually go and, and activate, you know, the network and, and, and start having those conversations. And uh, yeah. if you're well prepared, you will do this more quick and more effective and will leave the right impression, I think. And you will be more successful eventually. Yeah. 
Great. Hey, thanks for uh, sharing this uh, with us uh, today, Guy. Uh, it's, it's always great to see you and, and hear how the company is growing and who, how you and the team are growing. Good to see that you're all safe. And, um, you know, we, uh, we look forward to, uh, to do this maybe once, once more in a year when you uh, probably are about to raise your next round. And yeah. the company and the team has grown and so have, uh, have the revenue. So uh, thanks again for sharing. Um, this is all what we do. You know, we, we like to share experience and, and, and be thought leaders. And I think you're a thought leader in this domain in the early stage financing. So that's great that you're doing that and sharing this with the community. So uh, wishing you a great holiday. Um, take care, take good rest. Also something that is really important to recharge, yes. not next to doing sports, but also to clear the hat that enables you to come up with some new great other ideas on how to move the company forward. And then yeah. uh, we'll be in touch soon. Perfect, thank you very much. Cheers, thank man. You all. Thanks. Bye bye.